One of the things that we've seen in my research is that if you look at where inventors come from, there's lots of groups who seem to be r really highly underrepresented in the inventor pool. So, for example, there's very few women compared to men. There's very few people from low-income backgrounds compared to high-income backgrounds. There's far fewer minorities than there are, um, you know, white whites. Our research tried to see, well, is that just to do with the fact that people have different preferences or different abilities? And that really doesn't explain very much of those differences. So, for example, if you look at kids born into the um, top 1% of the income distribution, they're 10 times more likely to grow up to be an inventor than kids born into the bottom 50% of the income distribution. And relatively little of that is due to their, their ability. It explains some of it, but very little. So what does explain a lot more is the opportunities and the exposure many of these uh, kids have had at a young age to, to innovation. If you're born into an area and if you're very smart, but your schools are lousy, there's lots of crime in your neighbourhood. You don't even think about the possibility of going, growing up to be a, you know, a real inventor. So we call this like the lost Einstein or the lost Marie Curie type of effect. So my name is John Van Rienen and uh, I'm Gordon Billard's professor at the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the Department of Economics and the Sloan Business School. So there's a large number of different policies that have been put forward to try to stimulate innovation and I guess on the one hand, you might say there are uh, policies, for example, on the supply side to increase the supply of uh, engineers and scientists, of people with human capital, uh, high human capital, which creates more innovation. So that's one direct way of trying to create more scientists and inventors. Um, another set of policies you might think of as more demand side policies, which are to do with trying to subsidize investment in innovation like research and development. So some policies are kind of general policies, so think about the tax system. You could try and alter the tax system by uh, having a credit for research and development to try and stimulate uh, more research and development by making it cheaper. That's very popular in the US. It's been going on since Ronald Reagan, in fact. Another set of, um, of those type of policies demand side policies would be to um, directly subsidise research and development. So um, if you think about the National Institutes for Health or um, other kinds of the defence, Department of Defence, there's a lot of um, R&D subsidies there, energy, uh, other areas, they're more directed type of um, activities towards research. And then finally there's other kinds of policies which um, you might think are more indirect but I think actually could be relatively important, such as increasing competition. So uh, competition has been found to be a big driver of, inno of innovation and improving productivity. Um, trade openness, openness to um, immigration, for example, as well. There's a lot of other policies you might not think of as immigration, of innovation policies, which actually can also stimulate innovation. In terms of evaluating them all together, um, you have to think of what criteria you would like to use. So um, one criteria is what's the kind of evidence in terms of the data on which things are successful and which things are not successful. So I think we have reasonably good evidence um, on the tax policy side that those do seem to be uh, effective in stimulating more research, and development and innovation. So there's been a lot of work by economists looking at that and I'd say there's good evidence for that. Um, on some of the other policies, th there's other evidence, some of it stronger or, or, or weaker. Um, I'd say my view is that you know, the direct policies, the direct subsidies, there does seem to be a smaller body of evidence that that kind of works. Um, but it's a much, you know, it's a, it's a much smaller amount of information. And you know, the trade-off I think you have between the two policies is that the tax policy is attractive because you're not having to pick winners. You're just saying, here's the tax policy and private firms can go out and do what they do. Whereas if you use the direct policies, you have to set up a more a bureaucracy, there's a risk of being captured. Um, on the other hand, with the direct policies, you can maybe focus on subsidizing the type of innovation that you might think has the bigger social benefits. So, you know, if you think about why we're subsidizing innovation in the first place, well, we think that the problem is that, you know, I get a good idea, I invest a lot in it, and the benefits don't just go to me, they go to all the other people who copy me. <laughs> so my incentive to invest is much lower than it would be from society's point of view. You know, economists call that a public goods problem, that, you know, the benefits sort of spill over much more widely.
And of course, different types of investments are going to have bigger or smaller spillovers. So investments in basic research are likely to have much bigger spillovers than investments which are much more near the market where the firm can capture that and, you know, by taking out patents or the kind of intellectual property. So that's the kind of trade-off, I think. Um, you know, my, my, I think my view is that for the basic research, maybe a more directed approach is appropriate where we have clear criteria about what we really want, you know, artificial intelligence or climate change, green types of things, health. Um, where we're not so sure about what our priorities are, maybe a tax-based system is, 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 is a more attractive type of thing that kind of sets up the, the, overall, the overall system. The competition aspects, I, you know, I, I think, have been underestimated. So I do think that's also a, uh, a way of increasing innovation. So maybe we'll get onto this later, but the worries are if competition is weakening as trade protection increases, for example, that might be a force for actually declining innovation. You know, economists believe, and I think rightly, that where the market fails, uh, you need to have some government in intervention. Um, and you have to be careful about how you do that, because often there's unintended consequences to, to making these actions. But I think in the area of innovation, the state kind of has to be involved because of the, the fact that these spillover effects you get from innovation, the multiple market failures, the uncertainty, and so on. So I think that clearly means there has to be a role for the state. And the question is, what is the appropriate role for the state um, and how should the state think about making those interventions in the most effective way. And, you know, to do that, the state has to think about the evidence base on what we know. Um, it also has to think about maybe other criteria such as the effect of inequality, for example. So a lot of the policies that we might discuss might increase growth. But if that growth just goes to a very small number of people, we have one percent, then that's not the type of inclusive growth that we necessarily want. So I think when we think about the role of the state, the state has these multiple objectives, and we should think about not just the you know the direct market failures, but some of the other uh, interventions that we might want to have, which you know meets other criteria that we might want for good statecraft such as inequality and social inclusion and so on. So I, I think the way to think about this is uh, this distinction between supply, supply side policies and demand side policies. So a classic supply side policy is how do we increase the potential supply of inventors and the supply of human capital to create new ideas. And you know, the advantage of if we can do something on the supply side is that it's likely to have a much, more, uh, much larger effect in the long run and the reason for that is, is kind of a simple one. So the types of policies of um, increasing the demand for doing research and developments is, uh, you know, could, could backfire in some ways. Because if all you do is increase the demand for the a given number of scientists, and you can't increase the number of scientists, people like me, the, our wages might go up, but we don't get much more innovation. So to get more innovation, what you want to do is somehow think about the supply side and increasing the quantity and the quality of human capital. So how can you do that? Well, you know, in the short term, maybe you know, things like openness towards immigration of inventors from other countries. Maybe I'm self-serving, because <laughs> as you can tell, I'm a British person who came over to the US. So. But I think, well, generally, there's a lot of evidence that uh, immigrants actually are, are, are one of the um, groups who create a lot of in, 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 uh, innovation. So if you go to Silicon Valley, you see that's happening. So immigration policy towards the highly skilled is important. But I think in the long run, we want to create more homegrown talent in America. Uh, and that requires trying to increase the, uh, the quantity and quality and quantity of, of inventors. How to do that? Well, one of the things that we've seen in my research is that you know, if you look at where inventors come from, there's lots of groups who seem to be r really highly underrepresented in the inventor pool. So for example, there's very few women compared to men. There's very few people from low-income backgrounds compared to high-income backgrounds. There's far few minorities than there are, um, you know, white whites. And you know, our research tried to see: well, is that just to do with the fact that people have different preferences or different abilities? And that really doesn't explain very much of those differences. So, for example, if you look at kids born into the um, top one percent of the income distribution, they're ten times more likely to grow up to be an inventor than kids born into the bottom 50% of the income distribution. And relatively little of that is due to their, their ability. It explains some of it, but very little. So what does explain a lot more is the opportunities and the exposure many of these uh, kids have had at a young age to, to innovation. 
one of the strongest ways of actually trying to get um, these underrepresented groups into being inventors is to give them role models, mentors, the possibility, the possibility of becoming an inventor. Also to change the neighborhoods and the schools where they grew up. If, you, you know, if you're born into an area and if you're very smart, but your schools are lousy, there's lots of crime in your neighborhood, you don't even think about the possibility of going, growing up to be a, you know, a real inventor. So we call this like the lost Einstein or the lost Marie Curie type of effect. And some of our estimates suggest if you could do something to change that, you could quadruple the amount of innovation there is in the US. So thinking about you know, mentoring scheme for promising talented kids from underrepresented groups, improving schools, um, gifted and talented programs for these kids at schools, and venture education. That's a whole set of policies which are not often discussed, I think, in this debate, but in the long run could be absolutely critical for improving innovation in the US. The startling fact uh, over the last 40 years, I'd say, of the US is that you see increasing differences in a number of dimensions, so size is the most direct. If you look at the uh, fraction of workers in large firms, it's grown tremendously since the mid-1980s. I think uh, if you look at, say, the, num the fraction of the workforce in firms more than 5,000 employees, it's gone up from something like 28% to 34% since 1987. That's a massive increase. Concentration has gone up a lot in most US industries. Um, productivity differences are very large. Now, the, the question is, you now what's the causes of that and you know is it a problem and if it is what can we do about it i think my view i mean different people are different views. my view is there's multiple causes and the different causes are different in different industries in some industries it's less of a problem it could be a, a blast of competition so many manufacturing industries increased competition has meant that less productive badly managed firms get pushed out of the economy the more productive superstar firms expand and that's a process of competition that's not something you know um, which is necessarily a bad thing. It's hard to manage the adjustment for workers, but in terms of productivity, that's not a bad thing. On the other, um, there are other things though. So in some industries, like the high, many of the high-tech industries, we see that network effects are very important. So think about Google and search. The fact they have um, a good search algorithm means more people use it, which means they get more data, which means they improve the search algorithm. And this network effect enables firms to dominate their industries. We see this in, you know, not just in Google, but in Facebook and uh, many other different industries. So that's another kind of network effect. That's very important for high tech industries. But the fact we see this increase of concentration, increased differentiation in the non high tech industries suggests that it's not all that. So another factor, I think, is um, the role of technology and intangible capital. So I call this the Walmart effect. Why, do, why is Walmart so successful? Well, one of the reasons it's made this enormous investments in software to manage its logistics, getting things moved around the country, managing its inventory and its stores. And those are you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment, which a smaller chain or a mom and pop could never dream of doing. So this growth of this importance of intangible capital has given advantages to these already large firms, uh, these superstar firms, and made them even bigger. So I think, say, in re parts of retail, that's a, that's a big deal. And then finally, and this is the most worrying part, I guess, is that, in fact, it reflects, in some industries, a reduction of competition. So maybe um, what's happened is that um, the antitrust enforcers have not enforced antitrust properly. They've allowed too many anti-competitive mergers to take place. Uh, too many business practices which have pushed out the uh, promising new entrants or just bought them up and killed off their innovations. Um, maybe there's lobbying in order to um, create more barriers to entry. So that's another really you know, serious worry. And although I don't think that's the general story, because we see this happening in other countries where you know, there's been less of this, uh, these issues than there has been in the US, like in Europe, I do think it is an, it is an important thing in many, in many industries in the US. So, Hospitals I've looked at, for example, and you clearly see in parts of healthcare, you know, this type of uh, consolidation has been, um, I think, gone too far and reduced competition. Um, parts of airlines, part of telecoms. So I think that you know, in, in some of those industries, there's clear competition problems that we have to think about dealing and modernizing antitrust uh, law to deal with.